Welcome everyone to the April 2022 indoor meeting, um, including our first time guests and new club members. Uh, so please be respectful and please mute your microphones during the presentation. If you have questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat so we can have them answered at the end. Uh, tonight, our topic is mobile machines on Mars and our speaker is Ken Brandt. So in this, in this presentation, we'll hear the latest updates about robots currently exploring Mars as well as an overview of the Martian big picture. Ken Brandt is director of the Robeson Planetarium and Science Center, a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, and was recently appointed to the Board of Directors of the North Carolina Association for Scholastic Activities. Um, so it's really great to have you here, Ken. We're really excited about your presentation. Um, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. Step one, unmute. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining. Um, we're gonna be talking tonight about the motion machines on Mars. So I got a quick question for you. Um, and since I cannot see the chat with my full screen, um, Anna, if you could kind of uh, run run point on the chat part, um, I would pre appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so quick question, quiz. How many mobile Mars machines are there right now, currently? And ones that are still mobile. So we're talking living, running machines. Okay, hey, I've got some guesses in the chat. I've got three, twice, three times. Okay, keep going. Six. Six? Okay, that's a lot. All right. Two. Nope. On the ground, two. Two on the ground, yeah, fair. Okay. Mm -hmm. How many? Who said four? Uh, I think Steve said four. Steve is correct. Steve, you want to you want to take them off for us? You got them? Says, don't forget those in orbit. <laughs> oh, of course. I know there's like a half a dozen or something like that. We're not going to talk about them tonight, except where they accentuate the landing missions. Um, because Mars orbiters is a whole nother presentation and a whole lot of other information because they're doing some really good work flying around Mars. Um, but we're not talking about them tonight. Today we're talking about things that are at some point touch the ground and move on Mars. And so Steve, I believe, was correct. The answer is, in fact, four. Let me show you why. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is a picture of me taken last week. Our school board last week met, and they presented this fake check to Senator Danny Britt and Representative Charles Graham. Both of them are in the, end of the North Carolina legislature. And they pushed through an item in the budget to replace and rebuild my planetarium. Six years ago, the planetarium was destroyed by the hurricane waters of Matthew. And the flooding waters and so this check is the first this is the seed money essentially it's going to cost more than five million to build and properly equip a planetarium and we'll be talking about that some a little bit later because um because um, one of the things i'm trying to do is generate interest in our board of directors it's a community advisory board called the rising phoenix that's uh, trying to get the planetarium rebuilt um and it was through their work some uh, lobbying uh, work on my part and of course the work of these two legislators that got this in the state budget and of course the state budget as you know for refreshing change was approved <laughs> by the governor without much uh, squawking on either side so that was that was pretty remarkable uh, Danny Britt is a Republican uh, Charles Graham is a Democrat that should tell you how we like to get things done down here um, there's a lot of you know across the table that happens here um, would that this kind of partnership would spread elsewhere, I would be very happy. But here we are. Um, so that I just wanted to uh, cut into here. Let's talk about the Mars family. Now, the only thing that's not actually happening here, can you guys see my cursor? Yay or nay? 
Yes. Oh, good. Yes. All right, so that's the only thing that hasn't happened yet. We have, obviously haven't sent people to Mars yet. Um, but all of these other machines are machines that successfully uh, moved on Mars. Now, now Mars 2 over here in the lower part of your screen didn't move very far and didn't move very long. It was active for less than a minute. But it was, in fact, active on the surface of the planet Mars before it died. So whether you call that a success or not depends on whose propaganda uh, spin you're doing. Anyway, but all of these other machines, uh, including the one that most people forget, which is, which is the Chinese Zerong lander. Um, now, the Zerong is kind of, like, kind of a souped-up version of Opportunity and Spirit, uh, the two rovers in the corners here, that definitely set the records for survivability on Mars. Uh, these machines are very, very long-lived, and... Um, opportunity finally died because of a global dust storm a couple of years ago. Spirit, uh, I think 2011, a sand dune got it. It drove into a sand dune it couldn't get out of. Um, but Curiosity, of course, the one in the top here, is still driving around on Mars after nine and a half years. And that's going to be the subject of my August talk for you guys. It's the 10-year anniversary of Curiosity and all kinds of cool stuff NASA will be doing to celebrate that. And, of course, Perseverance. And But no sight of ingenuity. Okay, ingenuity is not here because it's not a rover, it's a helicopter. All right, so um, opportunity will always hold a special place in my heart because opportunity was the, literally landed um, as I was just starting to do planetarium programs for third graders in the Robinson Planetarium. So this thing has gotten on Mars, landed inside this little crater, that you know, little tiny crater uh, that had... Uh, sedimentary bedrock in it and ample proof of everything opportunity was sent for find the water and it certainly did it found lots of evidence of water over the 26.3 miles it drove before it stopped driving but opportunity's biggest legacy i think for me was just the idea of the public engagement that it sprouted um you know so opportunity basically took all of us on a on a almost 15 year tour of mars and finding new discoveries all the way. So I, I really have a special spot in my heart for opportunity. Of course, curiosity. Um, now when you're looking at curiosity, somebody needs to wash very badly. <laughs> There's a lot of Martian dust on that thing. Um, that's what happens after nine and a half years of living on a planet that's really dusty. Um, you know, dust collects everywhere. And uh, fortunately, it hasn't yet got into the um, experiment inlets on the uh, top of the rover. But... Who knows? This, uh, this rover is projected to last at least 20 more years until the RTG radioisotope thermal generator um, stops producing enough uh, or decaying enough plutonium to keep the uh, heat differential going in its, um, what is that called, a thermocouple to keep the power running. So this is the drive of Curiosity. You can see it all the way up here through uh, almost Sol 3000. Obviously, this uh, this thing is rather out of date, but we're going to update you here in a sec. Um, uh, one of the things that Curiosity has, has shown is the lake deposits, a delta, and a mountain that water flowed down and altered the rocks in the mountain. You can see this beautiful pile of sedimentary layers here. And this is a really easy question for an earth science class we're teaching in high school. You say, which one of those layers is the oldest? You know? Um, and of course, because gravity works, the one on the bottom is the oldest, almost always. Um, that's the law of superposition, and it happens here on Mars as it does on Earth. So we use a lot of what we learn about geology and landforms here on Earth to inform our discoveries on Mars, or their discoveries on Mars. Um, Curiosity figured out that there's all kinds of goodies in the soil of Mars. There's all kinds of, in the rocks, all kinds of traces of organic materials and compounds that could be signs of life. That we definitely know Mars is capable of, of uh, supporting life. Did life actually sprout on Mars? We don't know that answer for sure yet. But there are lots of tantalizing hints here and there. You probably heard about most of them. All right, so Curiosity, where is the rover now? I'm going to click on this, and maybe we'll, you'll, you'll see when I, what happens when I get there. All right, are you seeing a, a screen that says Mars Curiosity rover on it? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Good, good. That's uh, that's what I wanted to see. All right. So here's Curiosity's current location right here as the Sol 3449. I'm going to pull this down here so you can get an idea of the traverse. This is uh, Curiosity's path since it landed on Mars. 
And so you start here, whoops, okay. All right, maybe I need to small this down a little bit. There we go, yeah. Okay, so that's where she is now. And you can see, so you can pull this up anytime. It's one reason why. And I'll be happy to share this presentation with any of you who want to have it. Um, so you can use it for outreach when you're doing outreach. Um, so panoramas and some 360s, curiosity, curiosity missions and the blog, uh, updates in the blogosphere. This is pretty cool because, oh, that wasn't supposed to happen. Okay, try this again. Sorry. Okay, we're having a little bit of a fight with that link, but that link uh, works if you're not inside PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, I promise. All right, so anyway, when you go there, um, you see every couple of days, one of the mission scientists or engineers or drivers will post about where Curiosity is right now. So this is really, I think this is really great because of course, a lot of the attention that's currently being cast towards Mars is on the backs of perseverance and ingenuity, of course, because they're the, the new kids in town. You know, the Eagles sang a song about that, you know. Um, so Curiosity, yeah, yeah, been there, done that. But it's very cool to see the perspectives from these uh, mission scientists and engineers. Uh, like they were, they were talking uh, last week about escaping from a rock that had trapped them for a couple of weeks. And they finally figured out how to get around it to keep going. So um, this is a really good set of resources here. And like I said, um, be happy to share the PowerPoint with anybody who needs it. Uh, it's actually a Google Slides presentation. I'll just share it with you. Just send me an email and off it goes. All right. So of course, perseverance and ingenuity back here. This is a really carefully crafted selfie um, with uh, perseverance holding its robot arm out and then turning the Watson camera around and taking these images because Watson has like a, a, a a telescoping lens so it can change its focal lengths, which is pretty cool. Oops. Are you still seeing the... In the 10 months since the rover has landed, we've been busy, and it's been a year of perseverance. From operating during COVID, to the challenges we experienced with sampling, to interpreting the scientific results. It's such an appropriate name for the vehicle, but also for the team and the mission itself. mission has a series of firsts that will help future generations understand more about our solar system. Look how nice and shiny you are <laughs> compared to Curiosity a few slides ago. One of ago. my favorite moments was seeing our first rock core sample, looking down the tube when it was still in the drill bit and confirming that it was indeed a success. We're up to 10 now. now. that we've collected the samples, everyone wants to know when and how they'll be coming back. We can't wait for the future mission to pick them up and ferry them to Earth to analyze if any of them show signs of ancient life. The first flight of a powered aircraft to another planet. Another highlight of this year was working with the helicopter team to deploy ingenuity and experience the first powered flight on another planet. It was so amazing to see the team adapt to the environmental changes in order to keep flying. The helicopter has become a real asset and partner to our science team. That number is now 26, by the way, 26 flights. It feels great to be part of making history. What motivates us as engineers and scientists exploring another planet is the opportunity to continuously learn more. Now that we've toured the floor of Jezero Crater, we look forward to investigating the Delta, a part of the crater where a river fed into a lake in the distant past. It's almost as if we're starting a new mission because we'll start to cover new ground and make new scientific discoveries. I wanted to pause this for a minute because this is one of the few times where you can see like the whole, uh, the whole crater in context. In the foreground here, this bump sticking up here with all the rocks on the edge here, that's the part of the Delta. It's a delta remnant. And then behind it, in the far ground, far, and the far be behind is the rim of Jezero Crater itself. 
And so this is what um, Perseverance sees every day on Mars. It's pretty cool. What I'm most proud of is the team, how we operate the rover, overcome challenges, and the dedication that everyone brings to their job each and every day. All right. I love the sunset. All right, so getting back to our presentation. Let me uh, slide here. Okay, there we go. Uh, resume the slideshow. There. Okay, so all these different instruments on uh, Perseverance have, um, have purposes, and some of them are souped-up versions of what was on Curiosity. The SuperCam laser, for example, uh, is a souped-up version. All the cameras are, as you might expect, nine years better than the ones sent by Curiosity. So you can imagine all the different uh, um, lens techniques and photography techniques and imaging that they're able to do with this one they couldn't do with Curiosity. Now, some unique ones include the RIMFAX, the ground-penetrating radar, which actually looks down behind the butt of the rover as it's driving, and it develops a about a, I think it's about a 100-foot profile of the sediment underneath. And one thing you notice when you see some of the RIMFAX, I don't have an image of it, but you can see that there's a strike and a dip to the floor of the crater. In other words, indicating it was probably bent or uplifted at some point in the past. Um, so that's one thing RIMFAX has shown us. Um, Moxie is very cool. This is new. Moxie actually generates oxygen out of the carbon dioxide atmosphere. And the idea, of course, is to send a whole bunch of bigger Moxies to Mars, have them produce and tank up oxygen before the astronauts get there when they actually go with people. So, of course, the sampling and cacheting system is brand new. That's a new thing. Um, all right. So, Anna, I'm going to stop here and ask if anybody has any questions. Sure. Yeah, we do have a couple questions in the chat. So, um Anne asks, how do we know how old the lake layers are? Uh, right now, all we can do is, all they can do is relative dating. That's one reason why they took so many samples of the floor of the crater, which is pretty uninteresting igneous rock, right? It's uh, in igneous, um, not basalt, it's the uh, magma that hardens underground, but hardens rather quickly because the crystals are still small. But there are crystals in the rock. Um, and I don't know what they're made of, but um, but it's um, uh, some kind of feldspar, I think. And not not feldspar, excuse me. Um, some kind of the internal version of basalt. But um, when the samples come back to Earth, the first thing that's going to happen to them, in all likelihood, is they're going to get radiometrically dated. So you'll get absolute dates based on the proportion of potassium and argon. I think it is isotopes in the rock. Um, so they'll be able to get a good um, absolute date. For the, sec for the sections, and then you can start relative dating from that point by looking at how many layers of sediment there are, how long they might have taken to form, and all kinds of other things that I'm not a geologist, so I don't know. But I know that they're um, going to interrogate and find that answer as soon as we get samples back to Earth. There's not an uh, experiment aboard that can do absolute age. We can do relative ages, though. We could say the floor of the crater is, is older than the delta, for example. Um, anybody else? Uh, yes, we have uh, Stephen asked a couple questions. Uh, the first one is, can you explain how the rovers take their selfies? Oh, yeah. Well, that's the robot arm you're seeing sticking out here about eight feet in front of the rover. They turn the camera around. This is the Watson camera here on the top part of it, of the turret. They turn it around and aim it at the rover, and then they take like 64 shots and they stitch them all together into a, um, into a mosaic. And the mosaic, of course, is the selfie of the rover in the background behind it. Uh, and that somehow they hide the arm of the camera? Yeah, they, they, they Photoshop it out. <laughs> uh, okay. Right. Yeah, there's, you'll notice if you look really carefully at the selfies, is like a blurry part in the lower right where the camera is looking back over its own uh, arm. And I guess for aesthetic reasons. Uh, like, like, for example, a lot of the panoramas, like the 360s, they will blot out the rover itself on the theory that you want to see Mars, not the machine again. You know. Um, all right, and we have a couple other questions. Uh, Stephen right. also asked, why does Perseverance drop its soil samples along its route instead of storing them up on board and maybe dropping them in one spot? I don't know for certain which of those two things is happening. I think it's being stored aboard the rover, but I, I can't swear to that. I don't know enough. If, if any of the other ambassadors under, know this, they can chime in and, and uh, help me out here, but I, I don't know. Um, well, I, I know there are 
they, they will be developing caches specifically for the sample returns. But I think until, unless they've identified which ones they want to collect and, and cache. Uh, so I'm assuming if it's dropped off to the side, then it's not something that they're going to eventually uh, bring back. Yeah, I thought they were going to try and bring back all 42 of them. I think there's 42 tubes. Um, uh -huh. No one to bring back because some of those would be like witness tubes or atmosphere yep. tubes. Um, and calibration tubes make sure you're not you don't have any contamination on the rover cross contaminating the soil samples so that much yeah, do now. So, hey if i can interject so i think really the, i think the plan is is that right now all the samples are stored on the rover and that nasa is developing a second return vehicle which will land mm -hmm. on mars the rover will find that vehicle and take the samples that it has and pack it in that and that will be the return vehicle so they're all they're not just dropping them on the on the on the floor of mars it's, it's okay. it is there at the rover and, and it will that's my understanding uh okay so uh -huh. all right, all right thank you one more question um rob asks how deep can a core sample be taken uh, about three inches or 10 centimeters down the tubes are basically about the size of a uh, a short test tube and they hold about the same volume so they hold, I think, 100 grams of soy sample, or maybe less, I don't know. Um, but it's not very much, and it's not very deep. So what they can do, though, is they can abrade down and then drill. So the abrasion, I think, goes down about a, uh, a tenth of a uh, millimeter, and then they, they start drilling from that clean surface that's been abraded off. So the first step is abrade the rocks, they can drill into it, pull the sample out, and then stow it. Thanks for answering those, Ken. I'll let you go ahead and get back to your presentation. We'll save the rest yeah. of the questions for later. All right. So here's the um, here's the idea. The sample collection uh, happens. Mars Ascent vehicle is uh, launched. It lands on Mars, gets the samples, puts them in the uh, nose cone here of the vehicle, launches into orbit, and then a third spacecraft uh, from the European Space Agency picks up that sample in Earth or in Mars orbit and transports it back to Earth and drops it somewhere in the Utah desert, a la Genesis and several other sample return missions that have come back in the past. And that notional is, uh, right now is roughly 2032. Um, I think that's what uh, latest NASA projections for when they can actually pull this off. Um, so uh, Perseverance is wild to continue collecting samples, and I understand it's still got about 30 tubes available for more sample. So let's press on. Hopefully, there we go. All right, uh, the resources for Perseverance, as you might expect, they're way more extensive. Um, you know, the where is the rover now? Exploring with Perseverance, uh, the rover updates, um, and there's an image of the week. So, uh, I think the image for this past week was um, was a, a remnant of the Delta sitting out there all by all by itself. All right. And helicopter resources, of course, Ingenuity has its own flight team now. And Ingenuity went from um, five test flights back in April and early May of last year to being a regular part of this mission. Um, Ingenuity will fly ahead where the rover is projected to drive and look at the terrain from that uh, 10 or 15 meter height. And that presents a, a very different uh, look at the topography. It's basically like if you're exploring and you want to figure out what's over the hill, you send a drone to figure out what's up over the hill to figure out if it's worth hiking over there. Um, well, uh, Perseverance, or Ingenuity rather, is doing the same thing. And Ingenuity has now completed 26 flights uh, over four minutes, and duration is the, um, is the average length of a flight now. And it covers, I think, about a third of a mile every time it flies. So Ingenuity is definitely a... And the best part of this whole thing about ingenuity, if you think about Mars, for example, what you learned in sixth grade was that Mars is a really thin, cold atmosphere. Trying to get lift in an, an environment like that has to be really tough. And those rotors spin at over 2,000 RPM to get, to get the uh, blades fast enough to actually lift it off the ground. Uh, the nice thing, too, is that ingenuity is not very big. The box that ha holds all the software, the cameras, the battery, and all that other good stuff is about the size and weight of a box you would pick up if you were getting um, 
your kid a softball to practice softball with at a sporting goods store. So the next time you see a softball box that the balls come in, that's how big that little box is, that little golden box is underneath Ingenuity. And Ingenuity, of course, is also solar powered. So um, the question is, how long are the solar cells going to last? How long are the, the um, how long will it take before it gets uh, dusted over? Like the same worry we had about Spirit and Opportunity about their solar panels. Um, well, Ingenuity is in the same boat. But this definitely bodes well for the future of airborne exploration on any planet. And of course, one of the big highlight missions that, um, not to steal too much of my thunder, but from the Decadal Survey, is the, um, the launch of Dragonfly, which is a, a car-sized drone with, I think, eight props that will fly all over Titan and do um, analysis there on the surface of Titan and in the bodies of water, around, uh, not water, methane, excuse me, on Titan. So uh, there's a planetarium program that's also available in flat screen, whoops, <laughs> um, done by Jeffrey Nee of the uh, Museum and Informal Education Alliance. If you're not, if you're the museum and science center you work for pretty often does not articulate with the Museum and Informal Education Alliance, there's something wrong with them at this point because everybody's done a good job of getting the word out. Um, so this is definitely, it's a free resource and you have mounds of material to go through. Um, if you have any kind of uh, relationship to Earth and space science in your science center um, or in the science center you work for, um, or work with, not for, excuse me. Um, so the, the Google Drive link to the slides from the, the, uh, the uh, presentation is here if you want to screenshot it. Um, there's two different, um, there are two different uh, versions of the Return from Mars Planetarium Program. The one Jeff did, and I edited a version for him that took out some of the stuff in the middle that wasn't really to do with Mars. Um, and then give it back to him, and they have that on the website as well. Um, notice the um, diversity here represented by these people. They, uh, JPL went out of their way to make sure a broad spectrum of folks who were working on this mission were represented well. Because, you know, if you see somebody that looks like you, you're more likely to do what they're doing, right? Very simple. And so, you know, um, very much about uh, diversity and inclusion. NASA is a very open, or for what they say anyway, they're a very open and inclusive bunch. I know the solar system ambassadors are. Anyway, so. All right, so Mars Public Engagement. This is actually a presentation that Sarah Marcotte and I, she leads uh, Mars Public Engagement at JPL. And all the information, downloadable materials, um, speakers if you want a guest speaker. Uh, sometimes I'll have, when I'm doing one of these programs, I'll like Megan Liu, um, or Megan Lee rather, um, from the engineering and driving uh, part of Perseverance was a, um, was a very good uh, speaker for us at one point. Okay, so um, all kinds of lesson plans and formal ed activities. Again, I'll send you the slides. Okay, and the point of contact here is right here at the bottom, Sarah S. Morcott at jpl.nasa.gov. She's the lady to ask about anything Mars related. Okay. All right. So, did you catch Tuesday's solar eclipse? And yes, Perseverance was wearing the proper filter to take the set of images you're going to see. Now, I just want to say, we're looking at an image of the sun as, as one young lady in the Big Bang Theory said, from Mars. You know what I'm saying? From Mars. We're looking at sunspots on Mars. That blows my mind right there. And you can see there's some really good sunspot groups here. So if you're doing solar observing, this is a great weekend to do it. <laughs> so watch what happens. Notice how the sun appears to be moving very slowly in the sky. That's actually Mars spinning, causing that motion. But that is the moon Phobos. Um, I'm not sure if we should call this an eclipse or a transit, but here we are. Um, and you can see some of the definition. Look at the pock marks here, the, the, the valleys carved out in Phobos. It's not like a little round potato. It's got, or as Stephen Colbert would say, is potato. Um, you now it's um, got lots of little rounded things in it. And um, it's very interesting. You see the profile of the, sub, the satellite um, by watching it cross from in front of its, the sun. So this, uh, this happened Tuesday. Uh, really cool, really cool video piece here. No, no, not what I want to do. Let's try that. There we go. Legacy hardware. Okay. Uh, let's talk sundials. 
All right. Every rover has them since spirit and opportunity. The two in the foreground here, the one on the right, opportunity, the one on the left, spirit. Those flew 20 years ago almost. And um, when we landed Perseverance on Mars, there we go, another sundial. Uh, the original concept was uh, pitched by Bill Nye. You might recall him. Um, he's the one that said, we need a sundial because we want people to be able to see the relationship of the sun and time on Mars. And maybe they'll figure out it also works on Earth. You know, who knows? Um, certainly the folks at the Moorhead Planetarium would be very happy with this because, of course, they're a huge sundial in front of their institution. So this is uh, an image that was taken yesterday and we're getting really close to a place called Three Forks, right off coast, off the coast of the Delta here. Look at this tortured series of sedimentary rocks. You got a, you got about a 20 degree strike towards you, uh, leaning down, and then about a 40 40 percent dip or 40 degree dip in the in the uh, tilt of the rocks here. And you can see they're all sedimentary layered, so they all formed at the same time. So some kind of event happened here after this Delta formed to uplift these rocks. And that's, again, one of those big mysteries. When you go to a place and you start answering questions, the first thing that happens is you get another box of questions, right? So this, this set of layers alone, how did this rock get here? Good luck. I don't know. Um, hopefully a geologist will be able to parse that out. You know, um, why is it striked, stricken here and then flat here? What's going on there? So there's all kinds of new questions to ask about when you look at a picture like this. It just begs more questions and you can hopefully, you can try to answer. So this is um, another set of images. This is the Delta proper and you can see that the, the uh, rim of the crater uplifting in the, in the distance. But again, these nice, in this case, horizontal layers basically um, in this set. So what's the difference between this one and this one? Tune in tomorrow. We'll find out more, right? <laughs> All right, so I wanted to share an activity with you. It's very easy to do. Um, now, uh, Carolyn Morrow and uh, Zawaski did a series called Kinesthetic Astronomy. You probably had some experience with this, either watching somebody else do it or doing it with the outreach groups you're working with. But this one has to do specifically with Earth and Mars. And it's going to help if you have a small, like, rubber eraser or something like that. All right, something fairly dense, but also something that's not going to hurt somebody. All right. So we start here, and notice the orange and blue cones here. Uh, I use orange and blue cones, very easy. So you get the orange ones out here, you get a total of eight of them to represent the orbit of Mars, and of course four blue ones to represent the or orbit of Earth, because Earth is of course a blue planet. That's easy, right? Um, so every time you say go Gators, or advance, or whatever you want to say, the person at this cone needs three people. Son, you want somebody tall, like um, they can hunt geese with a rake, kind of tall, right? You want somebody tall in here, okay? Um, and every time you say go Gators, or whatever the magic phrase is, everybody advances to their next cone. The blue one goes to the next blue one. The orange one goes to the next orange one. And you very quickly, you start out by handing, basically handing the eraser to the Earth person, hands the eraser to the Mars person because they're that close. In a schoolyard like this, it's only about three yards. Separate them here. But after two Go Gators, I asked the kids how much time has gone by. And it takes them a minute. You know, it, it depends on the age group and the, their ability level. But they eventually come to six months. And you say in that six months, what's happened to Earth? Earth's gone on the other side of the sun. What about Mars? Mars is getting much further away. And I, then I asked the kids to try to hand the eraser back and forth. And they can't do it because they're just too far away. So I said, well, all right. Um, let's go a couple more. So three and four. And by the time you're here at uh, station four here, Earth is over here on the far right, Mars is over here on the far left, we have an, a thing called solar conjunction. Okay, Mars gets into conjunction. And that's when JPL and everybody else, China and whoever else, puts their machines to sleep for a couple of weeks because the sun is a nasty, dirty, radio-emitting you know, radio star. You try and set a command from here to here, you're going to get gibberish because it has to go through the interference. So now, this is when I'll tell the kid, go ahead and try and throw your eraser to the person on Mars over here and try and hit him in the belly button, All right? Where his belly button would be. Um, of course, they miss wildly. And if the sun is doing its job properly, it's knocking down anything that's coming through because it's, you know, hunt geese with a rake kind of kid right here, All right? Pretty tall. You want somebody tall in the middle here, all right? 
So, but this is a very easy way to illustrate why we only launch every two years. And of course, by extension, if you're talking about you know, seeing Mars in the night sky with your telescope, you talk about how sometimes we're at opposition and it's very bright, like in position one here or in position zero here, and how sometimes it's very dim and it's hard to see. So, you know, because it's so far away. Now, uh, two days ago, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Mathematics had their medicine, excuse me, had their planetary decadal survey. Uh, this is the final edition that is going to the National Science Foundation and to NASA and to every legislator who wants one in Washington. So this is what they're focusing on. And we're going to keep it kind of specific to Mars. But I figured I would share this with you and kind of scoop them because this is pretty cool. Before I do it, do we have any more questions about the rovers or the helicopter? I don't see any in the chat, but if someone wants to uh, chime in. Here yeah. we are. Yeah, I don't mind being interrupted. I teach yeah. uh, elementary school. <laughs> yeah, so. Ken, I've, I've got a question. Um, oh. So I am, uh, I, I too am not a geologist, not even close. Uh, but my question's around kind of those sedimentary layers. Um, yeah. Do layers typically or almost always form level? Um, and I guess the question is, because uh, I'm assuming then any sort of change where you see those very much kind of at an angle or uplifted, I'm assuming would happen after the layers had formed. Is that correct? Exactly. Uh, okay. We assume, now it's a kind of a blanket assumption, but in basic earth science, you assume the layers are forming horizontal because gravity works. Gravity is pulling okay. everything down with the same force. So these layers most likely started out flat. So after they formed, something happened to tilt them. Okay, in this case, it's pretty obvious. This broke off of the other, the rest of the outcropping. But, um, but here, the cause of the tilt is not so obvious. And you really don't, nobody really knows yet what's causing this uplift. Um, maybe it was that volcanic activity that was in the center of what at one time was the center of the crater and it was a magma pool and it uplifted or something. I don't know. We're speculating here. Um, now, the, the project geologists may know a little more than I do, but as far as I can see, uh, there's no explanation of why, why these down here are almost flat and then these tilt and strike and then these are flat up here. So this, whole, uh, this is way more complicated than just a river dumping sediment into a lake bed, <laughs> you know. Yep. So, yeah, it's, it's really, really, um, uh, you know, it's complicated. And I'm sure that, um, especially with the rim facts, they can start to answer that question. Was there a magma pool or something under here that was uplifted and caused that uplift in the, um, in the um, outcrop? Mm-hmm. All right, so Thank Mars you. sample return is the most vital thing NASA can do right now. Everybody that was on this panel that was chiming in, all the, all the presenters, were like, Mars sample return or nothing, basically. This is what we want. We want these samples back on Earth from Mars, and we want them now. And as you can see, it, there's a history here, about 25 years. Um, so the highest scientific priority is the sample return and so that you know the, it doesn't get more um more intense than that um the mars exploration per, uh, program has another mission called the mars life explorer uh, in addition uh the nasm also re um, recommended that there should be an ice explorer that looks for ice for um for the possible um, or use by um, uh, settlers, people who go to Mars. Um, you know, that for in situ, this ISRU is uh, short for in situ resource utilization, which means land where there's already stuff you can use. Um, in this case, um, an underground glacier or pool of water would be ideal for you to land your sediment over because then, sediment over because then all you do is drop a pipe. Um, Again, a, you know, this is the fact that this is screenshots from a bunch of different slides they had. All right. And as you can see, they mentioned this thing like three times. Hey, in case you didn't miss, get it the first time, we want sample return. Oh, I, I think I hit the wrong button. OK, sorry. All right. I'm not sure why this is not advancing. There. OK. 
So the key take takeaways, look at bullet number one. In case you were wondering, they want a sample back from Mars. <laughs> okay. Um, as you can see there from the rest, I'm not going to read all these to you, but you can see, you can see where, where their priorities lay. They want to send a probe to Uranus. They also want to send a lander and an orbiter to Enceladus. And those are the three main things they want to get done in the next 10 years. Of course, pursue the other missions that are already on the blocks, like Europa Clipper and Dragonfly and all those things that are already in the planning stages. Um, continue on those plans, they say. So um, the new stuff is a mission to Uranus and uh, Enceladus. Those are likely to start being developed before the year 2032, which is when this uh, uh, survey expires. All right, so I'm done with this part of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions for me at this point? Um, we have one in the chat from Anne. She asks if the sample return has to be a person or if there's a way to have the sample return um, without a person. Oh, yeah, the whole thing is planned. They're planning on doing this robotically. Um, there are no humans involved in this except for the planning and the execution of the mission, of course. Um, so this is all going to be done by robots, you know, very smart robots. And uh, speaking of robots, you can, actually, you can actually work as a citizen scientist, as a volunteer, to evaluate images that Perseverance is sending back to help develop their autonomous navigation software. They're getting really good at having the rover drive itself, They're giving it all the parameters that it needs to avoid hazards like sand dunes and other things. So the rovers are getting very, or Perseverance anyway, is very good at driving itself around on Mars. Um, they basically say, we want you to go to this endpoint over here. You figure it out. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. You know, and off it goes. So... Uh, Ken, uh, I'm assuming uh, based on what I read on the uh, the, the ice giant uh, mm -hmm. comment, th that would not be, or, or they would want a an orbiter, not a flyby. Um, for the ice giants, they want mm -hmm. they want an orbiter. Yes, okay. They want a Uranus orbiter, exactly. Um, and the other thing that took me a little by surprise was their emphasis on a orbiter slash lander for Enceladus. I mm -hmm. thought that was pretty. That was pretty impressive. That was the big surprise for me. I didn't realize that anybody was even thinking about doing that. So, so there we are. Oh, by the way, in case you're wondering who I'm rooting for to get to Mars first, <laughs> I'll just turn that back around. Now. <laughs> I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anybody else have any questions to? Uh... Ask him. Uh, yeah, Ken, you mentioned uh, the, the the phrase. By the way, I really love that um, the exercise. Uh, that mm -hmm. put, that it's a should. very easy I'm activity to do. Yeah, totally going to have to plagiarize that. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. you mentioned Go Gators. Where yes. do you have an affiliation with the University of Florida? Uh, that's where I got my master's and bachelor's degree. Yes, sir. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Go Gators. Class yeah. of ninety two. Yeah, where were you? Oh, where, nice. When were when were you out at, at U of F? Uh, graduated ninety. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So we were there right, right as Spurrier kicked it all off. Yep. Yeah, baby. Oh, all right. So next hour we'll be talking Gator football. No, I'm just kidding. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> we suck <laughs> right now. That's the yes. short answer. Yes. Okay. We'll, we'll start with the Shane Matthews era and then move forward. <laughs> Good God. <laughs> anyway. Um, so does anybody have any other questions or comments about this? Um, like I said, I'll be more than happy to share the slides with you. Um, Anna's got my email and she'll be happy to, to forward that request out to me and I'll, I'll sure. make sure I share it with you guys. Yeah. So um, I know this is this always comes up and um, I kind of ask folks, uh, especially those you know, talking about occupying Mars and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and I'm just curious, what do you think is the biggest threat or the biggest obstacle that we need to overcome for uh, eventual uh you know manned mission and potentially colonization of mars all right you know we have solutions to all the problems that people bring up except for one this bit here the fact you're going to have to send human beings with all their frailties 
to this place. And they're going to have to have, have them interact in pretty close quarters for several years, in all likelihood. So, who do you send? I mean, you don't send a nut job like Elon. I'm sorry, but, you know, the man... You know, don't, don't, instead of buying Twitter, perhaps he should not post on it anymore. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My friendly recommendation to Mr. Musk. But... Um, but honestly, you know, a lot of the missions, like the Russians and the Mars Society, they're all doing these MRDS where they have simulated Martian habitats. When you go outside, you got to wear a spacesuit, take all the precautions as if you were on Mars. And most of those crews fail because they go nuts. Uh, one or more of them goes crazy and does something stupid. And then they have to shut the thing down and get everybody out of there before someone dies. <laughs> um, and that is going to be the biggest hassle. We know how to protect against radiation shielding. You know, basically bury, bury it and surround the, surround the uh, habitat with water tubes, you know, or big pool of water. Use that as part of the wall of your structure or go underground in a lava tube. So there's all kinds of solutions to that. We know how to make oxygen on Mars now. Um, you know, Matthew Watley demonstrated we can grow potatoes on Mars. <laughs> and as yep. Stephen Colbert would say, is potato, all right? Uh, so, you know, uh, the... Um, you know, the possibilities are really most, the engineering challenges are mostly solved. The other problem you have to deal with is that six months between Earth and Mars, okay, and the bone deterioration. Now, a human male bone deteriorates about 20% of their bone mass over six months, whereas a human female loses about 3%. Okay, so who do you send to Mars, first off? Uh, you don't send... Well, let me tell you a story about Bill MacArthur. Bill MacArthur flew this emerald, by the way, into space when he was commander of Expedition 12. He's from Robinson County. About a year after he opened up the North Carolina Science Teachers Conference in uh, Greensboro, he was standing on a stage. His, his PowerPoint presentation was on the floor on a table. He went to adjust it, and so he hopped off the stage. You know, pretty routine move, right? He snapped his hip. This is a year after he landed back on Earth from spending six months in space. So the last thing you want your astronaut to scream out first is, oh, crap, I broke my hip. Not good. Because not only, not only, A, are you probably dying then because you don't have the surgery capabilities to, re, you know, repin a hip. Um, you know, so basically yep. you send that guy out into the woods with a couple of weeks worth of supplies and and a gun potatoes <laughs> yes um so yeah so very likely unless we get some real advances in bone and bone uh, um absorption and non-reabsorption i should say um that happens in a low gravity environment or low net gravity environment i never i hate saying zero gravity because it's just goes, yeah. totally people the wrong idea it's like how about no net gravity can we just say that or apparent sunrise that's my other big one <laughs> Yeah, free fall. Well, nobody wants that. I mean, if you're an aviator, you don't want to be in free fall. <laughs> you know, yeah, unless yeah. you're in your ejector seat. <laughs> so, you know, you can understand why they shied away from that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point. Awesome. And I think something I've always, you know, cautioned. It's like, yeah, I, you know, and even if you can make it to Mars, is it a one-way trip? Because after how many, you know, you, you've got 12 months of, in essence, mm -hmm. microgravity effects on your body, but even... Right on mars you know if you're if you're able to survive does you know one third the gravity what does that do to our bone structure we don't know we don't have we don't have the data points we, we have, have an analog for that yeah <laughs> yeah yeah except we have we have one g and we have you know zero net the, the yeah. space station yeah zero net so <laughs> don't know if it scales you know logarithmically uh you know, yeah that's true linearly who questions. knows yeah there will only be one way to answer some of these questions, and that is to send the test subjects to the place and find out. You know. Yep. Um, hey, hey, Ken, it's Doug. I was I I, hey, I was curious. Um, I haven't heard yet what they've chosen or what's I guess what's leading the way in terms of habitat, um, because I one thought was, hey, we can we can we can land some a three D printing machine to to right. 3D print uh, a habitat, but there's not any water, or at least we don't have enough water right now. Right. You know, to, because you got to have water to basically bind whatever whatever you're using. So I was just wondering, had they solved that problem? Has, 
or is there something that's leading right now in terms of the what they're going to use for habitat? I yeah. honestly can't tell you. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't um, heard of it. Yeah. No. Um, there was a lot of talk about lava tubes a few years ago because then all you have to do is put a wall on each end and you've got a yeah. sealed compartment. Um, excuse me. But then the problem is, you know, lack of sunshine. You know, you're in right. a tube. Um under the ground so that creates a whole another host of problems for your you know very frail um yeah vitamin d absorption and all that you need yeah all that those goodies yeah that's and that that, that affects your immune system and mm -hmm. yeah. you know there's all kinds of you know i, I think technically we have the solutions to 90 percent of this stuff or 95 percent of this stuff but up here mm -mm, we're just not there yet um, you know, what do you give the astronauts to calm them down? You know, um, and, you know, what kind of um, what kind of cocktail do you give them to so they don't lose their creative edge and their thinking edge and their ability to problem solve, and yet keeps them from shooting each other? You know, because yeah. you know you've seen enough bad science fiction and you know, uh, you know yeah. sending human no, beings I, I, anywhere. I, I've sort I've sort of followed those studies that you were talking about that that. Uh, though I think the last one that the Russians were doing, uh, the thing that disturbed them most most was is that it it, it, it took only about twenty to thirty days before their crew reached independence. So they mm -hmm. actually stopped doing the work and stopped doing yeah. the things that they were told to do, and they yeah. you know they they started doing things they wanted to do. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> you know, basically, so they like you said, like like you, I mean, you really laid it out really well in your in your talk. It's that is that they really just kind of go nuts, yeah. you know. So. You know, we have to kind of try to understand what it is that kind of, you know, holds people together, you know, and try to replicate that, you know, mentally and mentally, psychologically, spiritually, you know, all those things that work together mm -hmm. to uh, to drive people, uh, you know, to make them cohesive rather than, uh, yeah. you know, uh, rather than crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if anyone's um, heard of any of the latest developments of uh, the Mars One uh <laughs> <laughs> had they yeah you know, i and i really hope they never get off the ground because i i'd like to you know if their if their funding dries up while you're on your way to mars uh that would be catastrophe um, yeah. <laughs> well the the thing uh boss Lanza, is very funny you mentioned them because um a few years ago right before my planetarium flooded there were 100 people that were selected to be the first cadre of people that might be selected to go to Mars. The next step was going to be a 24 astronaut selection. And those people would go off into deep training, if you will, to prepare for their mission. And three of the people that were, you know, Martian potential astronauts visited my planetarium. And we did a really cool program. We talked about Mars One and, you know, what it would, have, what it would take to make this thing work. And they had very interesting perspectives on on um, getting to Mars and stuff. One of them, uh, Layla Zucker, I think her name was, Dr. Layla Zucker, she was an attending physician at Howard University's emergency room. Talk about your ideal candidate for a Mars mission. This lady, you know, she, you know, she was, she had all the right stuff. She was very definitely a person you would pick. And so I felt really, you know, there's this, Part of me going, there's no way this is going to happen. And there's this other part of me going, if it does, I talk to one of the mission leaders or one of the people sitting in those chairs on the way to Mars in my planetarium. And so I felt really good about that. But like you say, Anne, it's not likely. Um, they, they were going to do a reality TV show on the training and everything. But that concept just never picked up or took off. And I'm not sure why it didn't take off. But, um, you know, Boss Lonsdorf, I, I essentially shut the thing down a couple of years ago. So it is defunct at this point. Uh, there's no plans for Mars One to engage in any more fundraising or in fact send their thing their people to Mars. So they're done. I mean it was it was a wonderful idea in the face of it. But um, you know, as you saw if you watch the Big Bang Theory, if you saw that episode oh, yeah. about Kelvin applying to Mars, that's exactly how it went. They did videos and stuff and and at one point I actually wrote some of the questions for their advanced interviews about mars you know um that they would have to answer um before they got selected so that was kind of cool it was a very uh, unique feather in my cap <laughs> oh yeah definitely definitely but yeah i mean and it's not it's not you know 
unprecedented about long journeys mm -hmm. um, where you were stuck, you know, while in 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 the in the uh, previous life of a, on a boat, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. as you're going towards sure. and and unfortunately, I'm sure people were not the healthiest and they were probably dropping like flies. So hopefully that doesn't really happen on the way to bar that they yeah. like figured this out before before they yeah. actually even take off. But um but it's not unprecedented. Um yeah. you know yeah. and um we've become a little too risk averse, I think. There's this a, is true a, also, yes. You know, there's an idea that you know we really it seems to affect people on a very visceral level when people die exploring space for some strange reason. Yeah. You know, more so than somebody dying as a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base. It happens like every two weeks, you know, and you never hear about it. But yet you lose a cosmonaut or an astronaut on the way up or on the way down, because that's where 95% of the problems occur, or lead to fatalities, is up or down. Um, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody has actually died in space yet. You know, you got cosmonauts so, so. died on the way down, astronauts died on the way down, and astronauts died on the way up. But I don't think anybody, once they hit a stable Earth orbit, I don't think anybody's uh, passed away. Which I guess is good, because it might grind a program like the space station to a halt. <laughs> it's also why they make sure you're pretty healthy before you get on the rocket in the first place. Right. Yeah. They would not send me, for example, to the space station, because, you know, that would be a high risk. It wouldn't be smart on any of our parts. <laughs> So, okay. well, um, if nobody else has any other questions, I really like, would like to say thank you on behalf of everybody for coming and speaking with us today, Kim. We really look forward to uh, having you back later this year. Yes, of course. Thank you. And thank you Great guys job. for coming. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Great thank job, you. man. Thank you. And congrats on the, uh, uh, the uh, funding for the, uh, yes. the, the rebuild. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to the time when we have a science um, science exhibit, uh, extravaganza down there, like astronomy days or something like that. And we mm -hmm. invite all y'all to come down and do the outreach thing. Because it's going to awesome. be, when, when the planetarium opens, it's going to be a big deal in Robinson County for like three years. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so that first three years, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of outreach and stuff and trying to, you know, sow the seeds where people keep coming back. And of course, uh, you know, that issue is after a while, uh, things get old. I understand that. You know, just look at Apollo 16. <laughs> How many people yeah. celebrated that anniversary last week? You right? It was. But, yeah. <laughs> but, um, so, well, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Yeah.